Okay, here I have a Technics SUZ980 amplifier. And basically this thing's all working. But after I got that Sony amp going for a friend, um, he gave me this one to have a look at as well. This has actually got a large integrated circuit as the output, a SVI3205. Stereo power amplifier written on that. Uh, got a little bit of dust in here. This one's actually got a cooling fan on the back, which is a bit different. It's got a couple of video inputs, so uh, it's sort of that era. Probably getting later in the 90s, maybe. Still got photo on it. CD, obviously. Got super bass, whatever that is. Got a, some fluoro display here, so we've got fluoro VU meters. Looks like it's got some other little graph there, mute light, and then there's some numerical alpha numeric displays there, which must tell you which input we're on. And I did have a quick look through the holes in the bottom of this thing, and I can see some joints that look a little dry. Something over near the, the amp chip there. Yeah, there's definitely one through there is getting rather dry. That's making the camera go dark, of course. So, about the only way to work on these, you can unplug these power transformers. They've got these horrible connector things, but I prefer not to pull them out. I absolutely have to. It looks like the other connector is actually just soldered on, or the other ribbon cables just soldered on. These white things, you can flip part of the cover off there and pull them out, but then you get these sort of tin copper wires, and they can be a real pain to get back in again. So generally, if I can avoid it, I don't unplug those things. So the way to work on this really is to take the back cover off and lose that. Um, don't know whether this one, I'll have to see if this one runs without a fan. Some of these will go into protection mode or something without a fan. And then I'll remove the front cover and then unscrew the transformer, which is on a bit of a metal plate by the look of it, and the circuit board all as one. And then I can flip that over and work on it like that. Um, because generally getting rid of the transformer needs is more trouble than it's worth. We might have to see, you might have to take the power switch and this little power board off the front panel. And then it looks like the rest of the front panel has these white connectors, so that should unclip and be removable. And just leave the power switch attached. Quite a heavy transformer in this one. But there's not a lot else to this amp. It's got a speaker protection relay by the look of it, or that could be a standby relay. It's the only relay in there, so yeah, I'm not sure if this has got a speaker protection. You know, it's in the area where the speaker terminals are, so hopefully that's what it is. Looks like this has got a pre-out main in. And you're one of these sort of Panasonic polarised type figure eight connectors. Don't know if they really mattered, but what I might do is we'll plug this in. Because I'm not familiar with this one at all. Is that a figure eight lead? Yes, I've already got one in the PowerPoint, and that's handy. Look at this thing. Power on. Oh yes, so it's actually got CD on the alphanumeric there. VCR1, 2, tape. No, it's a quite a good display. And yeah, it does have... Oh, that's the volume level. Ah, so this has actually got the decibels and the thing there. Much like a modern surround amplifier or something. Bass treble, etc. Oh, so that's, oh, so that's like a tape, tape monitor, so this is maybe set up like a um, normal audio cassette. Oh, you yeah, record and play back on VCR1. Oh, it does have a tape out and play record, so, but you can do it on the VCR as well by the look of it. So that's a bit different. Super bass, so they all light up. That's um oh yeah, the well to be fair the fan's only got a two pin plug on it, so that's not gonna have a sense wire, I don't think I don't think this thing's gonna have any idea whether there's a fan. It was a problem with some of the later Panasonics. The fan was actually um soldered I think from memory to the board. Or it had a little connector straight under it that soldered to the board and they'd get dry joints and the amp would intermittently go into protection mode. It would actually come up and start flashing protect on the front. And that was a bit of a pain to track down when I had one of those. 
but it, you know, I think it was the amp chip or something, but it turns out it was just the just the fan disconnecting and being one of those three terminal type fans. Um, the micro in there could sense that it was disconnected. So we'll start removing this back panel. Which is probably going to be a lot of screws. Have to take those links out pre pre out main in links that likely would have to come out. And a lot of screws along these sockets here. Of it. Where that screw go? So take like those links out. The speaker terminals have to be closed up. Have I missed anything? No, it's coming. And of course we've got the mains socket. I was hoping that was gonna be detachable, but it's not. So yeah, Panasonic didn't make that real good. I think I might just have to unsolder that. Sony were much better at designing their amps and stuff to be worked on. Unfortunately Panasonic who made these Technics not so much. They were never the nicest things to work on. But not the end of the world, it's just a bit annoying when you've got to do things like this. So now I can get the front uh, back panel out of the way. Still got the fan attached to it. So the little front panel is the next thing I've got to work on. And yeah, that's not the nicest looking thing. I assume yeah, we've got some screws underneath. Thankfully all these screws look to be the same size and colour. Anyway, so that's starting to come off already. There may be clips on the end or something. Something feels like it's still connected up this end. So those plugs are starting to come out already. Volume controls. Oh, well, this volume board may be plugged. No, it's not plugged in. Is it just clipped on the end? Definitely feels like something's holding it there. What am I missing? Oh wait, oh, okay, the volume control. No, it's connected into the other board. So that should come loose. But no doubt Panasonic did something fun here. The board seems to be lifting up. Like I say, I've never been a fan of their gear because it's not as easy to work on as the Sony's. Oop, something's coming loose. So it's lifting up with the board, but it seems that the board still is somehow attached. What am I missing? There's a screw there, I reckon that's going to be it. That screw there. If I can find one of my screwdriver, is going to be screwed into the plastic of the front panel or something silly like that. In fact, the board's lifting means it's not screwed to the chassis, so sure enough, that's a very Panasonic sort of thing to do. Unless if you had the service menu, it would probably tell you that and make life a bit easier, but it's not that often we have the luxury of service manuals. So there's a screw under the, probably the headphone socket there. Uh, it's actually the knob came off there so probably should have a look especially these connectors edge connectors on these front panels they are the sort of thing that tends to get dry joints and yeah I can already see I think that second pin is it a dry joint or just some sort of bit of stuff on there I'll resolder those I think oh that's actually on the potentiometers 
So that's the base and that control. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. That's the actual edge connectors up here, where the holes are, square rectangular holes are. And they don't look too bad, but they don't look mint either. Of course, another little connector over to the volume control, always something that could be iffy. And sometimes it seems like it looks like. What on earth is that on a diagonal? Looks like they mounted the display control I see on a strange diagonal path there. I haven't seen that before that I can remember. Sometimes the fluorescent displays will get bad connections. Looks like you've got to remove that cover to find out. So yes, yeah, so for some reason that power thing popped off. So maybe that has to be removed. So I'll put that and the two screws that went with it over there. And I guess now it's really a case of removing this power transformer and whatever holds the circuit board to the chassis, probably around the heatsink and stuff there. Okay, there's a screw in the back of the transformer of all places. Really not good having the power transformer which weighs a ton attached to the circuit board, but Unfortunately, Panasonic like to do it that way. It's not going to lift. Oh, okay. Maybe we. Oh, no, I think we do have to take these two black screws out here. Should have got a longer bit for the drill. And then there's two gold screws on the face of this, holding the actual heatsink to these couple of steel brackets coming up either side and I think they should get that bit loose so there's a big long screw there which came out of one of these so I was at the one down through the board I think is there anything else holding this board on? no it's actually, ah, oh, no actually I'm wrong looks like we've got to unscrew these brackets so I didn't need to Looks like you can actually leave the gold screws in. Bit hard to see from the angle I'm on. And possibly even leave the two black screws on the circuit board in. I think I could have actually. And then we can just take two screws out. And the heatsink should come. You want it actually attached to the board if possible, not flopping around, because then you'll definitely get dry joints. Or likely to on the amp chip. Yeah, that's the go. And bingo, that's loose. Actually, I probably could have left the tra transformer there. It looks like the board actually flips upside down, even with the transformer still attached. Even though I've disconnected it, it is, or unscrewed it, it is sitting on the board quite nicely. Or sitting on the base, I should say. While well, the board can be worked on, yeah, the, the connections to the amp chip are certainly not the greatest, and there's a couple of, I'd say, transistors there on the heatsink, and they look like they're on the verge of being dry. And yeah, definitely some components around here. Quite a few of them, the solder's starting to crack around this area here in particular. It's probably worth checking those capacitors. I think there's some electrolytics, there's one little tiny one, a couple up against the amp chip, they're definitely worth a check. A lot of these other ones, when they're away from the heat, like over around these small signal things, they'll probably be fine. But I might just do a quick ESR check on most of those. But yeah, whatever this component is, like I said, these transistors, I reckon if I gave them a wobble, even just moving, yeah, that's, I think they're pretty, I think that end pin's pretty much dry. Yeah, the end pin on this one too. And if I just wobble that round a bit, I'll probably break all those connections somewhat. Because that's very common. Also, these connectors where they come onto the board often worth resoldering. Power section looks pretty good. I probably should be checking those. Just for safety's sake, even though this thing's running, always check those filter caps. I shouldn't have really been, been poking my finger on anything until I've checked those. 
but like I say, running amp, they're normally going to be discharged. So there's about a volt on that one, and less than a volt on that one, but still should always, for safety's sake, never trust those things. But you know, just once you've done this for years, you tend to get a little bit lax and not sort of check things as well as you should. But for anyone who's not used to doing this stuff, it's, it still pays to treat everything as dangerous and potential shock hazard. But yeah, that transistor is definitely on the verge, or voltage regulator, or whatever it is, on the verge of being dry. I guess we could even take the heatsink. Whoops, got a screw attached little clamp there off and see what the hell we've actually got under there. That's a long screw. Just keeps coming. And we've got a D1265 and a B941, so that's probably a regulator for positive and negative rails of some sort, maybe about 15 volts or something to run the preamps and stuff. Had a rough guess. Make sure I tighten that back right up. Looks like it's got some sort of little thermistor here, which is actually loose, even though I haven't touched that screw, so that's a bit of a worry. You want your thermistor screwed down. So that it protects if this thing's starting to overheat. Whether that's just for some sort of feedback in the amp circuit or whether it goes to some sort of protection or something I'm not sure but it may well I guess with a amp chip it's probably not like a feedback in some of the old amps where they had to have thermal feedback and stuff to stop them going into some sort of thermal runaway or something the yeah, other than a quick wanting a quick bit of a dust here very little dust in it thankfully Doesn't need to clean it out though. Trying to get a heatsink muck all over your brush. Just blow that out. Clean that back up a bit. And I guess lift this up and give that a quick flick out. Oops, we're losing a mount there. So we've got a few loose plastic mounts under here. The big question is it looks like it might have come from there. Maybe not. Where's the screw hole? Maybe that just sits there. Got one there. Yeah, they don't actually have screws through them. They're just there to hold the board up by the look of it. So another <coughs> Panasonic type of quirk there to do that. And yeah, speaker. Any of these sockets should always be checked. The solder joints on them, these all look fine. But if anything looks even slightly iffy, it's best to go over them. Yeah, there's a little resistor or something there in the power sections looking partially dry. It's got a bit of a crack around this, the solder there, almost a whole ring around it. And a few others there. Mm, what was that? So I think I might start just doing this area a little bit. Oh, that one came sucked right off when I put the soldering on it, so, so that was definitely on its way out. That's good practice to go over these things and if there's some dry joints then there'll be more on the way. Connector here. Yeah, there's a couple of these that are looking rather dry, this one in particular. Anything with wires attached or anything like that that can move slightly, always at risk of playing up solder wires. A couple of these aren't the greatest, but they're probably okay. Look at these. I probably should work my way there, just might do a couple of these resistors or whatever they are. That one there, not the best.
over here, these little resistors and caps and whatever around here definitely iffy doesn't take long to do them just being careful not to bridge any solder joints or anything while you're doing it easy to get solder between the components where it shouldn't be and short something out and do all sorts of damage so you just got to sort of matter of angling the soldering iron the right way and sort of pulling up as you leave the pad the right way definitely don't move towards another pad that's right next to it or you're likely to drag a bit of solder across this whole area really wants resoldering it's not the best and this should keep this amp going for a long time if no one does anything silly to it and then one of the main things to do here of course is these transistors because they are really dry yeah that one that middle pin just pulled away and same with that end pin since I put the soldering on and it melted you can see it crack and again it seems to be that end of the transistor the middle one and the left end at least when I've got it upside down like this not very good I say these edge connectors are pretty right for now. I'll just have a go at them and just see. Yeah, they're pretty good, I think. Often you find it's the end pins. I often just do the end pins because they seem to be the ones that get dry joints on them first. But these look pretty good. Probably not really worth doing, but. but I tend to do them anyway just to make sure <laughs> and I guess anything around this amp ships probably ideally wants doing anything close to it where the heat is Keep an eye as you do it to make sure you're not shorting anything out. Don't like the way they've done that in the factory. They've made one thing face another thing, which is never good. Very easy to short those sort of things out. When they bend the leads towards each other, which they don't normally do, but sometimes they do. These joints are fairly good, but it doesn't hurt to go over them. If some are starting to go, like I say, the, the rest of the board probably isn't that great either. Especially in the areas that heat up and cool down a lot, like around this output IC and the heatsink. Always at a higher risk of problem. Anything that's yeah, mechanically connected, where some things can move slightly every time the amp's moved around, or again, heating and cooling and contraction and stuff, expansion. Always seem to be trouble areas. And I'll do this output chip. Even though it doesn't, it kind of, I don't think there's any crack joints there, but they all look ever so slightly iffy not nice shiny joints on them they're a bit dull so that's always a bad sign did I just short that out? don't think so but a 
if in doubt you can always get the multimeter and do a continuity test between pins and sometimes you'll find they are actually connected together by circuit board tracks I, I would have thought those two were but no they're not that's always a way of something there but not a short but yeah if you're in doubt just measure each one of the one next to it could do the same with these transistors because it's a bit hard to see with all the flux on them no that's all good Just see the end pins on this chip. I think they're all right. And then I think we'll give the caps, even though I've probably resoldered them all, give the caps a test. I guess we should check them first before resoldering them, but it doesn't really matter. A little bit of solder wasted if they're near 40 isn't the end of the world. Got, I don't know what we got there, some sort of specialised connector by the look of it. A couple of these little transistors, whatever they are, don't look the best. Speaker terminals, yeah, they're okay, I think they don't look 100%, but because they get fiddled with a bit, it doesn't hurt to do them. A little bit more solder on there makes them a bit stronger. Protection relay seems to be pretty good, and yeah, all the inputs look pretty good. Yeah, I think that's all pretty right. There's not even any bias adjustments or anything in this. It's all in that big chip. So next thing I need is ESR meter. I think that's got a battery in that. Oh, a lot of dust on it. Yep, she's going. Okay, come on, zero. Yep, she's zeroed now. I've got to find where the actual capacitors are. More dust there once wiping off too. Okay, I started having a look at the ESR of some of these capacitors. This is a tiny little one I can actually get to from the top. Can I, oh, is it going to show something or not? 7.2, which is actually pretty good reading, given that it's probably only a tiny little thing. What is it? It's probably not even a one microfarad, that one. No, it's actually a 10 microfarad at 16 volt. And 10 microfarad 16 volt is 8, so that's within spec. Let's see if I can get some of these from the top here. 0.44. These are probably 100 mics or something. 0.59. And we have a 33, so that's one trillion really in spec, I think. Oh, yeah, they're both 100s. So one's measuring slightly different to the other. Hundred. Know, how many volt were they? Sixteens. Should be around 0.7, so they're within spec. I think that one was 0.6 or 0.5 or something. Yeah, I've got a good connection to it. 0.6. I doubt any of these are going to be faulty. They're normally pretty good quality in these Panasonic amps. It's a bipolar. I don't know if I've ever tested a bipolar one. 
That's pretty low, so it's good. You can usually tell when the caps are faulty because they're way out of range. Come on, connect. Two point four. That's a bit bigger, but that's going to be a low value one point six. Yeah, so these are all pretty good, I think. Did I get these other ones? That's probably going to say they're four point sevens. Two point three. Two point three. Which is oh, well, that's forty seven. Yeah, that's okay for a small. Lower voltage, 4.7. That's probably 100 mic or something. That might be another one of those 33s, I think. So they're all within range. Check these other couple, I guess. 4.2, what is it? 3.3 mic, and there's a couple hundreds up the back there. Seven. That one's getting up a bit to the end of its range. If that's 100 mic, and 0.7, and they are well away from any heat. So well, they're 16 volt. 0.7's right on. Oh, there's one more little, little tiny one there. 6.6. .6. It's probably oh, it's at 10 mic. 16. Yeah, well in range. I don't think there's much point testing these others. I might just quickly go over a few and just to see. You never know. Come on, connect. Mm, that's very low, that one. It's a 10 mica. That's a 10 mica, so it's probably got something across it. Or oh, the readings just. Yeah, it's probably a resistor or something. Six. Six. Come on. Six. All measuring very consistently. Except the odd one that measures very low. But that shouldn't be a problem. As long as they don't measure high. Come on. Yeah, they're almost identical. These are probably all isolating caps for each input or something. All doing the same job. Or something in the tone. I don't know what they are. It's low ish. Come on, that's a little higher that one, which could be a sign of something. Also, I'm going to connect to this one. It's also measuring around the same, so they're probably lower value. So look at those ones. They are. One microfarad or point one even one I think. So they're all within range, I think. There's nothing wrong with any of those. So I think we can reassemble this thing. Gonna have the dry joints, checked all the capacitors. And everything's pretty right. Got a heat sink back in place. Because that'll be the main thing to Get, over, get the circuit board in place. I think that big long one came from over here. Yep. Sometimes it pays to do these by hand just with the circuit boards, make sure you're not. Make sure the circuit board's sitting down and you're not about to crack it or something with, by using a drill. And 
I guess we have to get this back on the front panel. Also worth checking these boards for dry joints. All looking good. Probably the switch is a bit of a clean off while I can get access to them. Just check everything on this board. Just have to tilt it in the light a bit sometimes to get it right. Just check every joint. It's all looking pretty good. Maybe one or two on those edge connectors are not the best. Pots are a little iffy looking on the tone controls. in there. Now where's that power button? Can't really tell that was probably the upside was it? I think so. And I'll put some screws of that wherever they went there. that on to do it. Okay, well, I'll get the being careful not to scratch the front panel on any parts of the chassis there. Big headed screw there for the back of the headphone socket. camera might have to do it from above screw in the power switch just make sure everything works speaker switch and power switch I actually haven't put the transformer back on that's moved a bit back against the back there. Oh, that's it. Power socket board. Well, actually, before I do that, I probably should put that back one in so that it pulls back to the back panel.
load it right up hard against that. And then we can tighten these ones off. Even worth checking these connections on the transformer itself. They all look good. on this in the right thing they've got to get this bit that sticks out here under the board because that's where the screw went through and stopped me getting the front off all oh, looks good good thing I screwed that transformer down before turning it upside down that would have come crashing off about all you can do to really service an amplifier put a screw back in for that front panel bit of an odd design that but I guess that's what they wanted to do and I guess I'll really need to solder that back on to give this thing a test run best way to do it. Might as well basically uh, there's a bit of dust in that fan so I'll just take that and clean that off. That's probably why this thing's got a bit of dust in it because it's got a fan and all they do is suck in a lot of dust. Yeah, give that a good clean. And it's on the other side of the might even be worth I don't think you can pull the blades off that one. Problem is you can't really get a brush down in there to clean them either. Because it's got this guard over it. So there's a quite a bit of dust you can see on the blades in there. Well, probably a bit of compressed air would be handy. I can probably get the paintbrush bristles down in there a bit. Yeah, that's getting the worst of it off anyway get the worst of it off you could actually get a cotton butt or something down in there I guess uh, if I knew where my methylated spirits had gone which of course it's wandered off again it's always gone somewhere and then that one had a in it come on so just to satisfy the customer you can actually get a cotton bud down in there And wipe the worst of the dust off that, doesn't hurt. Makes it look like you've actually bothered to clean the thing properly. There may be a way of pushing that impeller off, but, or that fan blade thing, but I don't want to risk it with these plastic fans. You're probably likely to break something. Normally they're not something you can disassemble. You'd normally order this as a replacement part and just change a lot if it was noisy. Probably actually get in between the blades are you? much easier to clean the inside of the round bit out from the back because you can get right up to the grill and just rotate the blades with it. That certainly looks a lot better than it did. Like I say, it doesn't really make much difference to anything. A little bit of dust won't worry, just something that's electronic. But doesn't have to give that a bit of a clean up. And at least that's a bit less dust that'll be sucked into the unit one day, maybe. Solder our socket back on. Yeah. 
bit of an odd design having so much heat sink over this fan wire. You can't really get to the connector and grab it to plug it back in. Maybe there's just enough length, not really. I'm going to have to try and squeeze that around it and so I can hold it and see it's got it. Another sort of Panasonic quirk there. And now we can... I think sitting on its ends the best way. Putting it on its front's a little risky. I guess I'll get this apart before I put that back on. All these RCA sockets are kind of dirty. Got a bit of dust and muck on them. So it won't hurt to just get a bit of paper towel or something and just go around on them. Just makes them look so much nicer when they're actually clean. Don't know if it really affects the performance at all, makes a better connection or anything, but it certainly can't help hurt. I mean it probably hasn't most of these sockets probably aren't used for anything. I think it's a nice little touch to get them all shiny and silver again. Even if they're not used, always make freshens the amp up and makes it look nice again. Some of these speaker ones might as well clean the dust around them. And whatever that other port is, what is that thing? Remote control tape tuner and some other little remote socket here or something so probably if we've got other Technics units in the range you can remotely control this thing from them or I don't think this has a remote so some sort of functions probably fed through it maybe to synchronize other units or maybe to do something with this one Screw that back on. Ah, this circuit board hanging off this power thing is getting in the way of the speaker thing, so that's a, another bit of a oddball bit of design there. Something you definitely wouldn't see in a Sony. There's the camera. So, yeah, Technics and Panasonic, I don't know, they never. Quite as good as Sony for the servicing side of things, but at least they're pretty good gear when they're running and fairly reliable. So it's not the end of the world, but yeah, they just never really cared about people having to fix their stuff. Whereas you pretty much guarantee a Sony, everything's easily unpluggable and easy to work on without too much hassle. Is that plug in place? Seems to be. first onto the chassis and then tapped all the sockets to it. Probably can go back to using the drill on this. Being gentle of course. Just because it's an impact drill doesn't mean you use it on impact mode. Just gently press the trigger and it's just a normal screwdriver reel. But a bit better than the actual... They do used to make rechargeable screwdrivers but they were pretty hopeless things. I've used one a few times. Maybe a couple of different ones but they're just generally too slow. They're nice and light is about the only thing they got going for them. But they're also very slow. You don't need anything that slow normally. You want to go a little bit quicker. And it's always good when the last screw in your hand goes in the last hole that you can. And a couple of those didn't line up the best, which I'm not sure why. So just needed to push that socket a little bit. And probably the same with the speaker ones here. 
can see where the screw's been and it's not quite ending up in the same spot which I don't like it kind of looks like I haven't put it back together properly but that's all pretty good and hang on our little red socket there doesn't look like it's quite back in place so maybe I've got that a little bit out might have to just loosen a couple of screws here before I go moving it and then I'll just put a small screwdriver in there that's not small enough that gets into it oh yeah that was a little bit off where it should have been and yeah, that's still not sitting where I should really be the whole panel may have slid slightly to one side But most of the screws line up where they should. Never gonna get it exactly in the same spot again, probably. Okay, there's our little join us and really when these sockets are dried out they look a bit crappy again, a bit dusty and stuff so it hasn't cleaned them up hundred percent. They've actually got some sort of coating on them by the look of it. Okay. So everything's plugged in. Should be safe to turn this up again. And hopefully I haven't stuffed anything up in it. Shouldn't have done, but you never know. Well, we have a display back on the front. The speaker's main and remote. I think I heard the relay click in. Yep, there goes that, so that means there's no problems with the output or anything, though we still could have something wrong here. I guess if I get CD player going. Tape record. Hopefully there's our CD out. Again, being careful because there's live power on this thing now. And it's easy to touch some of these transform transformer terminals or power switch terminals here that's the secondary of the transformer that's still probably some fairly nasty voltages these are 71 volt rated capacitors so there's probably 50 volts of rail or something there's a fuse there which is probably directly wired to the mains and this brown cable up here to the power switch probably the active of course the actual power socket itself on the back so that you can see the plug comes into these live terminals and like I say these other lower voltage but still dangerous on the transformer and then this board here again power switch and stuff so not good to mess with let's turn the volume right down oh it's actually this is just a switch ideally you probably didn't turn it off but I can plug the speakers in I think like ah this one doesn't have banana sockets on it so we're back to the leads with bare ends on them annoying so in that case I will actually turn the power off just because there's more chance of shorting these sort of things out even though this is those little clip little spring loaded things now how have they set the channels up on this main is the top ones unfortunately manufacturers don't have a standard way of setting what is left and right on the same it didn't lock in on the same channel sometimes they're all on the one row on the top or bottom sometimes they're half the top and half the bottom row now where's my other speaker cable gone ah, there it is always hiding under something and you should never twist these wires up above an amplifier or anything because there's a chance some of these bits of copper will break off so always do them above the bench or somewhere preferably above the floor or somewhere would be even better so they you don't have any conductive bits floating around on your bench either if you ever sit a live circuit board on there or something there's a chance it'll short something out but definitely never above the equipment itself
Don't. Quite low on the VU meter there on one channel. After all that, I went and stuffed myself up by thinking about how some of them are on the connections below and I went to the, I've hooked up twice to the same channel, one for remote speakers, one on the main, so I wanted main left and right. That's what I mean about them not being standard, really annoying. Better. Oops, I've got some heat sink paste on the loose here. I've got to clean that up. I don't know if I've touched there, but there's a bit of a goo on the corner here, so something's touched on the amp somewhere. On the chip. Damn, stuff gets everywhere. Again, being careful because this is live. Not to put your fingers around any corners inside the unit. Treat that stuff as toxic. That Heatsink paste, these techniques do sound a little bit different to the Sony amps in my opinion. They Sony seem to be very flat like this the sound you put in is the sound you get out, whereas these seem to adjust the change the frequency response a little bit or something. It just seems that way. They're not quite as it's almost like they're adding a bit of treble or bass or something to them. But there's one thing I like about the Sony's, they seem to pretty much be the same when you put the tone controls and everything to the middle and you hit the direct button or not direct pretty much sounds the same whereas these things these don't actually have a direct button I'm pretty sure they don't sound quite as a, like the original there's something done to the frequency response bit of noise there when it hits zero not the greatest design there. You can actually hear something click when it goes right down to zero volume. It's literally when that display changes to a couple of couple of dashes there. Slight clicking sound. Yes, doesn't I don't think it sounds quite as good. It does something to the music. Even when you got the tone on flat. But maybe that's just not really the case. It's very hard to tell if things are different or not. Often you think you can hear a difference, but not necessarily the case. Yamaha amps, I'm sure, don't sound as good as other amps, but it's just something in them doesn't sound quite as nice. Never been very impressed with them, but and a couple other people think the same thing, but maybe it's all just in our heads. You can never tell all these things, but to me, this doesn't sound as good as that Sony amp. It's doing something to alter the music ever so slightly. Sure, that's boosting the treble a bit, even at the flat setting. Something's definitely different on it. I might have to listen on my proper speakers and compare it there. Volume knobs 
a bit dirty. Oh, there's a lot of dust in there. So it sometimes doesn't have to give these things. Often the customers are scared to clean these things. And you have to be a bit careful on these Panasonics on the knobs. It should be alright to use a bit of metho just to clean the plain black stuff. But you've got to be super careful of these plastic front panels. They've got some sort of paint on them. Like a metallic kind of finish. And some of them on these and televisions and stuff you can upset it if you use methylated spirits or anything but almost water on them. I think some people like to use Windex. I can probably just sneak a little bit under one of these slots and see if it... This is probably okay though. That's a bit of black stuff coming off so that possibly is affecting it. It doesn't look like it's affected. Often it'll start turning a whitish Sort of tinge on there if you've got it wrong. I've got some Windex here. I don't think I've ever really tried Windex on these things, but it's usually pretty inert, I think. This almost looks like it's got a kind of like a cigarette tar stain to it or something, so I'll give that a. But this has got ammonia or something, there's definitely something coming off it. So I better be careful because I don't want to ruin the thing. Nothing worse than it doing something weird to the finish on it. I have to dry off and see what it looks like. Well, I think that has. Yeah, it might be a little bit too light there now. It's definitely taken some of that colour off it, which is like a cig I'm pretty sure it's got a cigarette tar on the front of this thing. Something very much like that, but. Just want to be careful not to change it too much. The display perspective should be easy, but yeah, look at that. There's some muck coming off it for sure. And we don't really want that on there, but just got to be careful. We don't actually do more damage than good. But yeah, anything with this sort of metallic finish paint on it is. You've got to be super careful with. It was not a good era of coatings on things. And it doesn't look too bad in a way, but it's very iffy to clean this stuff. Yeah, I think that's that's coming up a lot better than it was. You can just apply the Windex straight to the the paper towel or whatever you use, and I just tend to use paper towel because then you can just throw it away as it gets dirty. There's no point really using cloth rags because they just get dirty and then start smearing the dirt around the place. But this is taking quite a bit of muck off this. This is definitely looking better. I mean, the owner does have the odd smoke, but I don't think it's come from him. This looks like it hasn't been cleaned for 20 years, which is often the case. Because like I say, people are just scared to scared to clean them because they're not sure what they can put on where. And obviously people think water and electricity don't mix, rightly so. So they're scared to even put a damp cloth on things. So it doesn't have to give them a bit of a clean up while oh, you got them. It certainly looks a ton better. I personally can't stand seeing the things dirty. You know, given they get hands all over them, they get hand grease and stuff on them. But yeah, that's come up a lot better than it was. There's still a little bit on the display. It's hard to get every last bit. It's got a few marks on it there. But yeah, at least it's, it's a consistent colour now. It was kind of had darker patches. And lighter patches. Yeah, that looks much more like it would have when it was new. <sighs> Bit of dust from my but the towel on there is about all that's on there now, but that yeah, that's come up heaps better. That's all a consistent there are scratches on the front there or some sort of marks, scuffing or something. 
Yeah, it doesn't have to get the brush under the buttons and stuff, just to, often dust builds up under them. Yeah, there's a little bit of fluff in there that's just come out. Yeah, I'm much happier looking at that now. It looks a lot better now. I probably should have cleaned around these switches while I had them pulled out the back of the front panel, but anyway. Don't always think about cleaning it while you're pulling it to bits. So I think I'm supposed to put the cover back on that, and the cover could probably do with a good clean as well. Often it pays to go around along the front lip of it before you put it back in, because that bit's down in amongst the front panel there and then you can clean the rest of it once you've got it all screwed back together don't wait if I put the colour screws off this thing there here somewhere there they are off better to just because of the vent slots better just to squirt it onto the paper directly and then just rather than risking drips going down inside the thing it's alright if you've got time to wait for it to dry out but I don't and yeah quite a bit of filth coming off that so it's a bit dirty and I guess that's the idea with these was to make the front panel match this sort of metallic finish on the covers it's just a bit of an era there I think in the the 90s where they had this kind of finish on a lot of things but yeah that's that's a lot better looks a lot cleaner and yeah that front panels come up really consistent there's probably a little bit on that phono button still and yeah that button there's some damage to the to the coating on it I don't think that is stuff on there, it's just I don't want to mess with that because it looks like it's maybe been scraped by whatever scraped the front panel there. Yeah, that's come up nice. kicking in when I wind up the volume. Let's see if we can see that. Oops. Yeah, it comes on as the volume goes up. Unfortunately the CD player sitting next to the speakers also skips as the volume goes up. clean there maybe. I'll put a little bit of muck on there now. It's probably being a little bit too fussy but that up to my other speakers to see what it sounds like but that's given it a good service shouldn't have any dry joint issues cleaned up and looking a bit better and capacitors all seem fine in it some people might recap it in that but 
I can't really tell the difference. I mean, if the caps are actually faulty, often in amps the caps will just lose a bit of capacitance and the, you have to turn the volume up a bit higher or something. It won't actually cause anything more than loss of signal. Um, some people think changing them for all these different higher quality caps makes them sound different, but I'm yet to see anyone show an objective test that actually proves that with test equipment, so really I think it's just their opinion. But this has got these have got fairly good quality caps in them to start with. They last a long time. So I don't think there's any point recapping the thing or anything. It's not that old a unit. Maybe if it's getting into the 70s now, they're certainly starting to get pretty old. And there probably is a bit of a a reason to recap those just for reliability purposes, if nothing else. But I mean there's old valve equipment like that old 1947 radio I plugged in car radio the other day and that's still going and look at it a few issues but the caps probably not one of them those old electrolytic cap capacitors certainly last a long time they probably were made a little bit more solid those big ones in the old valve gear but they can last for an awfully long time so I'm not really a big believer in recapping things for the sake of it and this guy didn't ask me to, you know, certainly if you want a full restoration on a 70s amp or something, it might be worth a recap, but I personally think these, this sort of era of amp, the 90s and that, much better quality uh, as far as build goes, it's later technology, things like MOSFET outputs and stuff, even when they've got these chips in them, and they generally are much better amps, better build quality, better parts in them, better design, and just generally sound better and, and last longer than the, the 70s ones which were largely pretty crude some of the basic 70s amps out of Europe and that are just you open them up and they're not even as well built as like a kit amplifier that we used to build and certainly not designed as well they're very low power and yeah don't have any of the modern features and the parts in them are pretty junky to start with and just the general build quality you now that's not that great so I'd, personally I'd prefer even though these aren't very collectible yet but this sort of era of amp generally much better than anything from the 70s even though the 70s look nice with their old analog VU meters and silver fronts and stuff there's no doubt that they're pretty cool looking some of them but um, a lot of them are nowhere near as well built as these later ones and not as well designed and the component quality and stuff still not as good circuit design not as good so I think I'd prefer to stick to this sort of era. But anyway, thanks for watching.